The following is an Ice on Mars presentation. Hey everyone, welcome back, where for the sequel to the last episode, we're going to talk about the sequel to the last episode. That's right, get ready for Puppet Master 2. What the fuck? Um. Hey everyone, it is once again me, Michael T. Bradley. And me, Audrey Ivancy. And we are here uh, to talk about Puppet Master 2. Let's give a basic overview of the plot here. So, so this is 1991's His Unholy Creations. Right, which doesn't show up on the screen at all. No. 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 That's just, uh, it's all, apparently that's its subtitle, according yeah. to the... And, and, and so it's a, a couple of years later after the events of Puppet Master 1, the seemingly happy ending that we got is rewritten so that everything ended horribly. I don't know, did, did we find out what happened to the... I, I guess the woman who owned the place must have died. She died. She actually had her brain extracted oh, that's through right. her nose. That's right, that's right. In the Egyptian style. Yes. And Alex, our Leonine hero, has gone insane. Totally. Seeing premonitions, having seizures. We don't actually see him, though. Right. Uh, quote, unquote, he is loony. And a group of parapsychologists... Five of them. ...including a brother-sister team... Hotties. ...come to the Bodega Bay Inn to investigate something for the government, although it's not quite clear why they're there. Did you get any sense of that? I think that I, I would just kind of deduce that there was probably, you know, they had heard something had happened. This place has been a kind of enchanted. They had brought that Camille lady that with the, kind of the Shirley MacLaine character. Yeah, they, they, make a, they make a note to point out that she is like Shirley MacLaine. Like, like they're the, the educated dropper. ones and she's the one with some special gifts. Right, right. The, the, the government angle, I thought, was very strange. We get a lot of backstory early on about, it's all right, go ahead and have your drink. <laughs> we aren't robots, though. Not trying to trick people into thinking we're robots here. It, it, there's this back and forth very early on about, like, oh, the government, you know, it, it, you can get lots of money, everything's overpaid for unless you ask for it. And it's like, why the hell are you here? And they keep giving backstory well, on... Well, they had that car, Right. They had right. a car. They had a government-sponsored car. That's right. right. Well, a van. A government-sponsored <laughs> van, because there were five of them. They didn't, right. weren't all crammed in there. They had all their uh, TV equipment and stuff as well. But it was like, I what government-sponsored paranormal agency is there? Why? I, I guess my question was, why the government-sponsored angle if it never came up again and never meant anything and only got in the way of backstory? Well, I think we can't all be Ghostbusters. Right. But... They could have had some unknown benefactor thrown out there to play with again later in the series. Yeah, I wonder what Bill Gates was doing at that time. <laughs> right, there you go. So they, they, they go and they investigate the house, and essentially one by one they get picked off by puppets. I mean, that's really... <laughs> and then Toulon, who's there looking like the Invisible Man, he sees Carolyn, one of the investigators, the sister out of the brother-sister duo, and he's like, oh, that's my dead wife. I need to put us both in giant puppet bodies. <laughs> Although that isn't revealed till the end. <laughs> right, right. And, and the other thing that's interesting is that, in fact, it's supposed to make sense because they had the same actor play his wife in a flashback, but neither of us... Right? Neither yeah. of us were able to figure out. I, I, I guess they were like, we have to make her look different so that people don't, you know, so that, I, I, I don't know, so that people realize that it's not just her in the past or whatever. But they did such a good job of making her look different that we, we did not catch on that it was the same actor. Yeah. I thought it was pretty interesting that all the puppets brought Toulon back to life from uh, Scarab Hill Cemetery that was just behind Bodega Bay Inn. That's right. There's this uh, glorious, beautiful bed and breakfast right there at the bay, this gorgeous seaside and everything, and then behind it apparently is Scarab Hill with Andre Toulon's corpse. And how weird is that, that he was just staying at the inn and they were like, well, let's just bury him out back. Mm-hmm. That opening scene, pre-credit sequence where they bring him back, I absolutely loved 
just shots of puppets being stood up in the moonlight. <laughs> the puppets are, are, they're just gorgeous, though. They seem to change size depending yeah. on uh -huh. what think, they're needed for. I think for. they grew a couple inches of wood. Yeah, they, uh, uh, that, that, that happens, you know. That's, especially in the morning, it happens. And, and, and another thing about the opening, still just great theme music. I mean, the, the, the Puppet Master theme music is, is probably... Uh, yeah, it's like uh, an accordion played on a keyboard, I think. All right, I can I can run with that. Um, <laughs> kind of like yeah, rah, 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 rah. right. Is that even a keyboard? I don't know. Maybe it's a Glockenspiel. <laughs> so, you know, and then the end of the movie involves uh, some stuff. I, I I think the best things in the film, uh, besides the puppets. I mean, the puppets are always the best, but relatedly, the human puppet dolls. Because, like for instance, Toulon puts himself into a human-sized puppet doll, and that, I thought, was great and uh, really effective. And the uh, the thing that's really disappointing about the ending, I think, is that, again, the big finale is the puppets turn on their master, who are controlling them, and they're unhappy about it. Mm -hmm. Because they were he was supposed to share some of that brew that kind of reanimated them or gave them more power, and he decided to kind of keep it for himself... Right. This was very confusing to me, however, because... All right, so essentially at the end, it, 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 if we were reading it right, there are three cups of brew. Brainstem brew. One is going to go to the puppets, one's going to go to him to reanimate him and the giant man puppet, and one's going to go to Carolyn slash Elsa to reanimate her in a giant female puppet doll. But uh, through the entire movie, and... but Oh, and you know, there was that great little thing where he's like... You give animals in here, you filthy puppets. <laughs> and it was like, what the hell? And then it went nowhere. It meant nothing. Because he was just like, well, I'll make do. Uh, yeah, I'm just so. going to cluck and like sound like a donkey. <laughs> yeah. So I'm part the pig now. Eh, life gives you lemons, you know. So, but it wasn't very clear what the big plan was. Because he kept saying, I've been asleep for 50 years and you've been gone for 50 years. Because 39 to 89, essentially. But the puppets were very weak because they didn't have their brainstem brew. Brew, but the puppets had apparently just been awake since 1939. Uh, yeah, apparently they've just been hanging out without brew, getting weak. Right, and so in '89, after years of the bed and breakfast being open, as far as we know, they were like, "Ah, oh, what the hell? Let's start killing people." Or, well, no, they were they were uh, used by what's his name. The, the bad guy from the first movie. Mm -hmm. And this whole brainstem thing to keep them alive was never brought up. Who actually, strangely, the body, the the wooden puppet body, the life-size one that Toulon puts himself in at the end, resembles the last man that had controlled the puppets in the last... Maybe that's why they flip out. They're like, yeah. oh God, it's Neil, let's take him down. <laughs> it's Neil, he's back. Also, that was it, that was so pathetic because he's in the body for like three minutes max, maybe, and the puppets turn on him. And it's like if you were making an immortal puppet body to live in post mortem, wouldn't you make it a little more impervious to damage? Yeah, a little hipper Steve. Yeah, I mean, like the puppets just poke him once, and basically his leg falls off, and green fluids gushing everywhere, and it was just like, wow, come on, Toulon, you skimped on the wood here. A little, little sturdier construction would have been great, but no, the plot didn't really hold up or make any sense, and uh, that was a little frustrating. I like, you know, he kind of looked like Neil, to me, also kind of looked like, like an Asian lounge singer. <laughs> Are you talking about his foot and eyes? Yes. Yes. Yeah, yeah. And um, like an over makeup Asian lounge singer, which is, uh, which is very, um, a strange way to go for that. In general, the script felt very cobbled together. It said the story was by Charles Band, and I literally think like one day he got drunk with some guys and was like, what if like puppets brought back too long? That'd be cool. And that's about as much story as he was involved in. Uh huh. Overall, I kept thinking about the script that somebody was sitting at a typewriter or a computer, I guess, by then and going, this is how people talk, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, all the time, there, there were things that it was like, this isn't, like, nobody speaks this way, nobody interacts this way. 
that that just doesn't happen. At one point, they talk about smuggling puppets, and I thought they said snuggle puppets. Oh. <laughs> I, was, I really wanted to see that movie. I like that uh, when Tunnler went for the, the brother in the beginning and they finally caught the puppet's body after they flung him around for a little while, they decided to have a dissection moment to right. see you know, how this thing was operating. Very alien, yeah. Notice that, yeah, no strings were attached. <laughs> it was just wooden gears in this fluid. Yeah. Yeah. And they had made some sort of revelation and some great discovery in science. <laughs> That's right. It was some sort of morphogenetic field. That that was what they were calling it. That scene has one of the best moments where the sister turns, sees her brother's corpse, and yells his name, Patrick. She really earned her paycheck patches. that day. She was <laughs> not patches the pony. How will the kids say no to drugs? But no, the um, that that scene. She she really she was going for it there. The what the fuck moments in this film. The biggest, I think, I'm going to start with the fact that there was a fascinating Egyptian, that's a quote, talking about a bay in New Hampshire, wherever the hell they are, Bodega Bay. When Toulon thinks he's seeing his wife in the first woman that he sees on the scene. Randomly out of nowhere, making fun of Hicks in this full of upper class white milk toast cast that we have. A little boy undressing a doll and whipping it? And a woman telling a guy, it's all right, I'm used to people washing my scent off afterwards. This movie kept putting me to sleep. Every time Toulon had his soliloquy to puppetry, oh, like, yeah. now that was, it, it, it reminded me somewhat of like uh, 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 Bella Lugosi and Ed Wood films, you know, the, the, even if you haven't like seen the actual films, if you've seen Ed Wood, you know, the whole like, left to die here in this rotting jungle hell i mean that's yeah you could pop popcorn and go to the bathroom and come back and <laughs> still going yeah yeah it was those were uh those were weird so what about that sex thing what was going on there you're you're a woman give us the insight you're talking about when when uh the girl that goes downstairs and seduces the guy about him coming up with her and she says everybody hoses off <laughs> after they've been with me <laughs> right i thought she's She's uh, probably pretty gross. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I interpret it as most likely she was like a hardcore squirter and <laughs> ate only fish or something. And so whatever might be coming out of her body in gallons. <laughs> but that bed looked incredibly dry. It did, actually. So I don't, I don't know what else. Wasn't that the blue bed when she's wearing the blue shirt yeah she yeah where she just appeared into it right it was like she was camouflaged like there. she had a floating head yeah it was it was it was disturbing yeah i Spe think yeah uh, go ahead go well ahead. okay speaking of sex scenes i have another mind experiment oh, for great. you because <laughs> it's <laughs> i don't know this is some disturbing <laughs> twisted game we're playing here uh, so and so long as you play with me on mine on mine okay sure okay all right, so close your eyes. <laughs> Take off your sweatshirt. No. No. Close, <laughs> close your eyes. This one isn't, it's not so much of a mind experiment, but think of the sex scene with the redhead. Do you remember that? Oh, yeah. The, the ridiculously you. tortured, like, it was the most unsexy sex scene ever. Yeah. Um, they tried to make, like, cotton sheets into, like, satin sheets. <laughs> Lots of leg pulls up. Well, and, and it was just very, I, I, yeah, there were, there were all these shots that were like, there's probably something sexy going on there's here somewhere. Be passion, maybe. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> the music will bring the passion in. But so the first shot on it is her head being laid down on the pillow <laughs> in that really, in, in that, uh. Slow, uh, awkward, will not be falling, but. Right, right. In, gently in, laid. In that, in that way that, like, is the kind of typical movie shorthand to show you a sex scene is starting. So tell me, in all of your encounters, you know, which I, I don't, I, in, in, your, <laughs> in your years of ever having sex, has it ever started like that? Have you ever been gently laid <laughs> down on a pillow? <laughs> this is ridiculous. <laughs> because... Have you, Michael? No, I have never been horrible. gently laid down on a pillow, oh. or neither, nor wait, n not nor, ni neither, neither, neither. <laughs> <laughs> I 
<laughs> Neither have I began something by laying them gently down on a pillow or laying their head well, gently what do you, down. What do you think, Michael? Just uh, my eyes are closed. What would you? Think? <laughs> <laughs> I'm I'm asking you know I, uh, because I don't think it's happened <laughs> because maybe I'm doing something wrong and the movies are trying to tell me <laughs> I don't think it's happened <laughs> if it did I wasn't there <laughs> all right you you can open your eyes thanks for playing along yeah, that's thanks. yeah it's I I'm really just trying to make you uncomfortable okay I, here, I got I got one for you okay all okay. right now you also have to close your eyes okay you have to imagine what puppet or what thing this is <laughs> raging an attack ow um what could it possibly be uh, who could it possibly be <laughs> well i think it could possibly be you <laughs> um it's it's, it's 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 there's <laughs> there it's it's, it's, it's it oh, like? oh oh it's um um staple remover <laughs> staple remo no uh, <laughs> <laughs> Keep going. It's only gonna hurt more. Uh, I, I, I don't know. Ow. Um, a uh, something that uh, a, 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 I, a, a wine bottle opener. No. Um, <laughs> are you sure it's not a staple remover? No. It really feels like a staple it doesn't, remover. Doesn't it? Doesn't feel like a little unusual, like right here on your finger. Well, it feels unusual in the sense does that it's hurt? painful. Yes. Oh, it does hurt. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I, don't open you, your eyes yet, but I'm going to tell you, it's, are, a, it's a chupacabra. <laughs> okay, so Do you it's believe a, me? No. Okay, well, look. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so you're using, like, a stuffed fish. To... It's a piranha. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so now, now I know how it would be feel, how the first few seconds of how it would feel to be eaten to death by a piranha. A uh, chupacabra. A chupacabra. <laughs> That reminds me of the sex scene from the first film, <laughs> and brings me to Leech Woman. Thanks. The Leech Woman <laughs> burning scene in here the was best. awesome. Was that was hilarious. Just her. <laughs> no, so it was it was the Hicks, right? We're back. We're back yeah. in the woods, kind of. <laughs> right, right. These these backwoodsy Hicks, which I kept thinking of uh, Cabin in the Woods during their intro scene because they are so they are the harbingers. Which is interesting that the, the people, the woman that they harbinge, I guess, does actually follow the rules and is like, I'm getting the hell out of here, but then she gets attacked by puppets anyway. Mm -hmm. So yeah, so we're at the Hicks house, right? And, yeah. And she's laying next to her husband, starts hearing strange noises and realizes he's being attacked by puppets. <laughs> like you do. Yeah, like you do. She gets out of bed. You know, not much of a housekeep goes into what is that the kitchen slash living room slash only room in the yeah, house? Yeah, yeah. Okay. And um, she sees what she sees Leech Woman. Yeah, Leech Woman and Blade and is hiding yeah, in the shadows. Yeah, that's right. And decides that she's going to mount her attack against these invaders that have come, murdered her husband. Right. And they're not going to have her. Yeah. And she is really the most effective puppet fighter pretty much through the entire she's series. She's my personal puppet hero. Yeah, 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 she's pretty awesome. And then uh, eventually Blade Blade does this ridiculous move where it's like, you have a friggin' Blade, you are right at hamstring level. Hamstring them, and instead he just kind of eh, jabs her once. Yeah, like a then, toothpick. Yeah, but then luckily she falls over and Torch comes in and lights her up. Which, Torch also lights up someone else, your favorite scene, I believe. Uh, is that the bed scene? Or was that the... Which scene was that In, one? Indiana Jones. Oh, my favorite scene. Oh, yeah. Okay. So there's this little kid... Out out of nowhere in some woods somewhere. By himself. Well, it, it technically runs away from his mom. I mean, we assume... Oh, does he? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, whatever. And, and she mention, mentions the dad. So we assume that he's living in a trailer with his parents in the probably, middle of the woods. Probably. Playing with a doll. Kind of a man and call style doll. And um, he decides to undress this doll and put up against a tree and pull his bullwhip slash switch out and start going to town on this doll. Well, guess who comes up to say hello without any words? Well, it's, it's a piranha. <laughs> it's a piranha. No, it's a torch. Torch, it? torch, yeah, yeah torch. apparently. Torch. Um, but but yeah, as this kid is whipping this doll, he's calling it Nazi scum. Having, like I said, as Indiana Jones fantasy, and who comes up torch in one of those helmets? 
Yeah. And so um, he decides he wants to play with Torch. And when uh, Torch doesn't do anything, he starts to whip Torch, and then Torch gets really angry. <laughs> and we assume Fricus sees a child, which yeah. is, uh, you know, that's how, that's that's what I like to see in my movies. Yeah. Speaking of Indiana Jones, mm -hmm. I enjoyed the George Lucas wipes in here. <laughs> I thought that was very timely for 1991. Yeah, turn in the page to another scene. That that guy from the sex scene who washed her stank off <laughs> in his first couple of scenes, he's very wacky neighbor Larry. And I thought, oh, I'm going to love this character. But then nobody, like, all the characterization just kind of falls apart and randomly falls on whoever might happen to be in the scene. I think especially the the worst uh, the worst case of like just characters doing things because it's like, oh, this is the time to do that is they're they're searching for oh, uh, the the main girl and her love interest who's the son of the Shirley MacLaine character. Camille. Right. They are searching for Camille because she's disappeared and she's actually She's actually in the dumbwaiter. One of the few times in a movie that you see a dumbwaiter reveal. Yeah. Just hanging out and playing there. <laughs> yeah, they're searching for... And, and they also... They set up the fact that Carolyn wants to find out if Toulon... or Well, she doesn't know he's Toulon. She wants to find out if, if the hotel was actually given to this creepy old guy in bandages who says that he's the owner. The Invisible Man too long. Right, but she never follows up on that. These guys just in general are horrible investigators. Like, you know, it's very poltergeist except for the fact that they don't do anything or talk to anyone. Like at one point, they, the two characters see a puppet with a drill on his head go into a room and they're like, let's go! And then about 25 minutes later, they get there, the... Puppet is already drilled, like, halfway through this guy's skull. And they don't call out saying, you know, Hey, Patrick, there's a puppet with a drill head coming into your room. Maybe you should do something. They come in the room, stand there for about a second, and then turn on the light. And then react. That's not, not before their camera's, you know, going. Right, right, yeah. It, they're obviously waiting for action. And it just... So, in general, bad investigators. But anyway... While out searching for this guy's mom who has disappeared and we know that there's something murderous on the loose. They take a break to go to the beach, sit around, talk about everything that's turned them into the people they are, and then kiss. Yes. Because that's, that's very, normal, right? That's how people important. interact, mm -hmm. isn't it? Yeah. The other thing that's crammed in here is backstory. This is very, like, there's all sorts of explanations for how the puppets work and how the the life reanimation stuff works, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. The, the problem is it doesn't really jive with the first movie, so I kind of wish they had just left it ambiguous. Do you feel like you understand the magical Egyptian puppet process more now? Um, I think, I mean, I guess so. I mean, I, it's like two different stories intertwined at this point for me. It was like, this guy had, like, a script, and now it takes brain juice. Right. Like, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, I'll be curious to see where they go with the third one. Yeah, me too. Another little side note here. Uh, th this is a movie with very strange pronunciations of things here and there. At one point, they talk about burnt entrails. Entrails, yeah. Yeah, and uh, Osiris, the, uh, yeah. the Egyptian uh, god Osiris. Osiris, yes. Right, as, as I'm sure you're all... I've been worshiping Osiris for a very long time now. <laughs> right, that's... Nothing's, uh... nothing's been happening. <laughs> So let's talk about the ending. I think I think we're good to talk about the ending here. I think we've reached the end of all of this. Okay. So the end is Elsa, confusing. right? Elsa never becomes Elsa because the potion doesn't go into her mouth. She spits it out. I mean, not Elsa. Right. Sorry, what, what was her name? Carolyn. Carolyn. Okay, so Carolyn... But she's the same actor who played Elsa. It's the Elsa. same actress that's supposed to become this live doll puppet, excuse me, and have this potion. But then she doesn't take it. She escapes. Right. So apparently the puppets, even though that giant female puppet burned up, they quickly give it to Camille. Dead Camille. Right. Sitting in the dumbwaiter. Right. Then drag her up to the attic, cut her throat, and position her... Above this six-foot-high 
puppet creature mm -hmm. so that uh, the blood flows into it and, and it's reanimated. And we know this because we get a little epilogue scene where she's driving around as, a, as the puppet creature in an old VW bus and... Kind of clown clothes. Yeah, yeah. Like entertainer. Right, and she's got the the puppets with her, and they're going to a children's, uh, a, a mentally insane children's ward to entertain. Yes, and she figures that no matter what happens there, if anyone hears about it, no one would trust these stupid, not, I mean, not stupid, ill kids. <laughs> <laughs> right, the... <laughs> Which it seems almost to imply that there are no administrators at these places. Yeah, totally. No, it's all it's ever. Also, you would think, oh, who's going to believe them? Well, if there are murders happening. But it's kind of funny that on the car it says happily ever after puppet show. Right, right, yeah. So I, I kind of thought that the end was implying... Well, okay, so the reason why it doesn't make sense is that the puppets seem decently okay. They don't seem weak anymore or worried about that but she used the last cup of juice so apparently they don't have juice maybe the implication is they're going to steal all these kids brain stems Ooh. and make new brain juice mm -hmm. but i want to believe that since they turned on toulon the idea was that uh they turned on him because they realized oh this wasn't just you know you weren't having us kill children just to get us alive again you actually were kind of crazy and now they really are going to entertain mentally ill children. That they are now like pit fighting pit bull dogs that have been turned into therapy dogs. And now like maybe in three, like Torch is gonna have like a little uh, uh like a little multicolored dress on. Yeah, I'm just curious how they're gonna get this gig. I mean it's hard to be willfully employed. Also the fact that she's living plastic, don't you think that might set off an alarm or two? I thought she was made of wood. They look plastic, don't they? They look, they look kind of like those, um, those like wax dolls what? from Lisa and the Devil. Yeah, okay, yeah, I can yeah. see wax or... But still, in any case, she doesn't look human. Like, she doesn't blink. No, she doesn't. Her yeah. eyes are stationary. The only thing that's moving is, what, her mouth? Right, it's, 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 like a, it's, it's like a mask over the top part of her face, so her bottom teeth are real. It's like some sort of African ceremonial mask. Yeah. That's painted to look like a cheap prostitute. <laughs> in clown clothes. I stop, you're getting me hot here. The, yeah, so it's it's a so it's possibly an upbeat ending. I don't yeah, I don't no, know. I'm excited for it. Number three apparently is a prologue, right? That's what I've heard from you. <laughs> <laughs> So that so that that'll be interesting. So yeah, actually, the first puppet master is out out of the ten that are made. It is the fifth chronologically, apparently. And I still don't understand what that means. That that <laughs> that means that four of the movies out of the ten <laughs> take place before number one. Oh yes, yes, I understand <laughs> what that means. Okay, all right. So I think we have covered everything here. I hope that uh, you guys. I, I I'm curious to see if there's any feedback from people who have. Uh, gone out and spent the four ninety seven to grab all all twelve of these uh, films available on on the set. See if anybody else is uh, enjoying watching these along with us. So for now, this is Michael T. Bradley and Audrey Ivancy. Have a good day. Bye -bye. If you have any sort of comments or feedback, please write to info at iceonmars dot net and tell us what you think. You have been listening to Ice on Mars.